And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn in them with me to Genesis chapter 14, where we'll be looking at this morning at really the whole chapter, but only reading uh, verses 14 through 24. Genesis chapter 14, verses 14 through 24, continuing in this sermon series on Abraham, and the series is called Blessed to be a Blessing, which speaks to um, the promises given to Abraham and the purpose uh, of the blessing, which is to be a blessing to all the nations. This is the sixth sermon in this series. I'll just a reminder about who Abraham is. He is this man who was uh, living in Ur of the Chaldeans, and he was there. That's an area that is uh, modern-day Iraq on the southern border of Iraq near Kuwait. He lived about 2000 B.C., he was not a great godly man, worshiper of God. He was this guy who was worshiping foreign gods. And the Lord miraculously intervened, stepped in, made himself known to Abraham, called him, brought him into a special relationship with himself, promised him his presence, promised him a place, a land, what we call it the promised land, um, promised him a purpose to be a blessing to the nations, and promised him a people. That from him there would be uh, folks who would outnumber the, the stars in the heavens and the sands on the seashore. So Abraham gets those promises. He travels away, follows, uh, not perfectly, we saw in previous weeks, but he traveled away from Ur and ended up in the promised land, the land of Canaan. He's hardly there a minute when famine hits the land. And he exercises great faith and says, no, the Lord is going to provide and I'm just going to... No, he doesn't do that at all. He, he gets out of Dodge. It got hot in the kitchen and so he got out and he heads down to Egypt. And in Egypt, God protects and delivers uh, him and Sarah uh, to preserve his own promise. Brings them up out of Egypt. They come up out of Egypt. He, we saw last week he divides the land with Lot, which was a great... Um, uh, effort at peacekeeping really and now Lot is captured by a foreign army and so Abraham goes to rescue him so that just sort of catches you up on where we are in the in the story in Genesis here chapter 14 so if you're able let's continue the story and stand for the reading from Genesis chapter 14 beginning in verse 14 When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Dan would be to the north. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen lot with his possessions and the women and the people. After his return from the, the defeat of Shed or La Aomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand and Abraham Abram gave him a tenth of everything and the king of Sodom said to Abram give me the persons but take the goods for yourself but Abram said to the king of Sodom I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high possessor of heaven and earth that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours lest you should say I have made Abram rich I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eskol, and Mamre take their share. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, would you please open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from this, your word. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And the children at this time are free to be dismissed for the children's Bible lesson.
There's a man in my former church who bought a, um, a, a, a about 1965 Corvette and um, had to have it restored because it was in New Orleans and it was totally, completely submerged in Hurricane Katrina. And it was about a 10 year process to get this thing restored. He was obviously not in any big hurry. And the guy who was doing it was taking apart, you know, every screw, every little detail of this vehicle and you know, re redoing it, repainting it, scraping off the rust, whatever you, you do to restore cars. This guy went through it all and it took about a decade to get it done. And so I saw this vehicle uh, when, when the guy finally got it back. He got it back really just a couple months before I ended up leaving Fairhope. And I tell you, the, the pictures, the before um, it was restored, after I, didn't, I don't have pictures of it submerged in water, um, but I do have, the, as it was drug out from the garage in which it was submerged, I have the pictures of it, what it looked like before, you know, covered and, and nasty completely and, of course, wouldn't run at all. And then having seen it in person afterwards, it was quite a sight, quite a transformation. It's a, it's a beautiful car. It's a, it's a really amazing kind of thing. I want you to keep that in mind as I ask you the question. This passage of Scripture, this, uh, these details about Lot being captured in this first war, really, that we see in Scripture, and then Melchizedek, why is this in the Bible? I mean, it doesn't have to be there. Why does, why does God put the things in the Bible that he put in the Bible? I believe this passage is here because the Lord wants us to learn that God is in the restoration business. That's what he is about, is restoring broken down, rusty, uh, destroyed. Uh, he, he's in the business of restoring these things. Uh, he's in the restoration business. Of course, it's more souls. It's human lives. It's you and it's me that God is in the business of restoring. And there's a sense in which when you look at Genesis chapters 3 through 11, Jim talked about how at ESL they, they, they take them to Genesis chapter 3 to see the fall of man. And when you read from Genesis chapter 3 until you get here to Abraham, all you see is that man can't. Now, that's a little bit of a play on... I don't, I don't quite understand it, but there's, you know, in modern times now, I think with younger people, they say things like, well, he just can't. And then, well, can't what? And, then, and it's not, you don't finish it. It's just can't. That's, that's, that's the end of it. And so I'm kind of working with it here. Because that's the way it is when you, read, when you think about man in Genesis chapter 3 and following. Man just can't. He, he can't restore things. He can't figure things out. He can't keep it between the lines. That's what you see after Genesis chapter 3. All, all we, what we see in Genesis chapters 3 and through 11, really the rest of the Bible, is that what man is good at is continuing to mess, mess things up, destroy everything. It's been said the only thing that man brings to his salvation is the f sin from which he needs to be saved. That, that's the only thing that you and I bring to the table when it comes to us being made right with God and being forgiven of our sin and, and being made at peace with God, the only thing that you and I bring to the equation is the sin that, that we need to be delivered from. So that's what you see in Genesis chapters 3, uh, 3 through 11. And then in Genesis chapter 12, it's as if God says, okay, I've tried over and over again, Cain, Noah, uh, Tower of Babel, you guys just keep... It, Okay, I'll, I'll, the Lord steps in in a sense, he, and He makes this covenant, this promise. A covenant is a promise of a special relationship, a special promise, special blessings. So God makes this covenant, and He's the one on the hook. God is the one who is responsible to fulfill the conditions of the covenant. Just last week, my son Charlie, who's at University of Alabama, um, sophomore there in school and he, he's moving from one place to another place and this first place he lived is a long story but he didn't have to sign papers and he, he put down security deposits and all that kind of stuff and so he's moving out into a new place where you have to go through that normal rigmarole and as a 20 year old probably very smart on their part they just don't rent apartments to 20 year olds <laughs> especially 20, 20 year old boys who their, their brain is still they still got some work to do and so um, 
So there's Charlie sending me some papers to sign, and and I've kind of, in one sense, kind of learning the hard way. You need to read things that you sign, and um, so so Charlie sent these papers to me, and and I said before I even got them, all right now, what happens with your roommates if if they don't pay? Is you know who's who's on the hook for this? And of course, I am now. You know, it's uh, all, of course all the parents sign, and I'm thankful for that. And he's got good Christian roommates, and and uh, so it's. It's it's a good situation, I believe, but at the end of the day, I'm the one who's on the hook for it. If Char- if Charlie skips town, if things go south at at Alabama and him and school or whatever, I'm the one who they're going to come to. That's the way the Lord is with this covenant that He makes with Abraham. He's the one on the hook. He's the one who puts Himself on the line. But again, God is in this restoration business. He is all about bringing about new life and human and human life, souls, and he puts himself on the hook to make it happen, to bring it about. Now, last week in the sermon, what I tried to say is that God's people, because they have been restored, they have been brought to uh, in a right relationship and made at peace with God. They then, in turn, want to live at peace with others, which is why. Uh, Abraham, in godly fashion, deferred, um, did not demand his rights, but, but gave Lot a choice of the land. And Lot, being Lot, amazingly called righteous Lot in the New Testament, but we see him sort of really looking out for himself, and number one, taking the greener pastures, and now as he has gotten himself close to the king at Sodom and, and Gomorrah, which would be down in the south, and uh, he's, he's captured and taken away. And, but what we saw last week was that God is in the restoration business and those who have been restored, they strive to restore relationships themselves. Today, what I'm wanting to say is that as man lives in this process of being restored, and if you know Christ, that's what happened. You have both been restored and you are being restored. People who are being restored, they want to see others be restored. People who are being restored want to see others be restored. They want to see the destructive powers of sin abated, conquered, vanquished. They want to see them come to an end. Again, when I've been brought into a right relationship with the Lord, when I've been restored, when you have, it makes me one who wants to do battle with the forces of destruction. Now, getting back to the 1965-ish Corvette, Stingray, I think. Beautiful car. Really, you'd like to see it. I'm sure some of you would. I want to go see it. He keeps it in his garage, cranks it up once a week, whether it needs it or not. (laughs) We'll drive it a little bit around the neighborhood, but only if the weather is like today, kind of just perfect. Now, I'm not going to cast stones at him. I might do the very same thing if I had that vehicle and invested that much in that car. But, you know, when it comes to the spiritual realm, when it comes to real life, we can't keep it in the garage. When it comes to being used of the Lord and being one who has been brought into a right relationship with the Lord and then wanting to be, see others be restored and delivered from sin and from the devil and enslaved as in captives of sin, we, we can't, you can't keep it in the garage. I can't keep it in the garage. We have to get out. We have to get engaged. We have to be involved. We who have been graciously called, radically transformed, granted extravagantly generous promises, and who have seen God be faithful to His promises, we can't keep it in the garage. We are called to do battle with sin and the forces of destruction. So let me give you four points that I'll work through rather quickly. Number one, God's people have an enemy. God's people have an enemy. This is what you see in verses 1 through 13, which I didn't have us read just for time's sake. But it tells us about a conflict between a coalition of kings in the north and then a coalition of kings in the, in the south. Four in the north, one main king there who was very powerful, and then four in the south. The four in the south included the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the first war recorded in the Bible. Not the first sin or first violence, but it's the first war, really, that's recorded in the Bible. And certainly there will be many more. And what we're reminded of as we think about this is that in this world, conflict is inevitable. There are always going to be fights. 
There's always, there are always going to be issues. There are always going to be problems. There's always going to be tension. Particularly, there will always be an effort by the devil to destroy the people of God. Which in this case would be Lot. Living either in or near Sodom. Captured. Taken away. Deported. And enslaved at that, in that particular time. When you, when you were a part of the losing side, you became a slave to the winners. You know, the devil hates. He's full of lies. He seeks to destroy the Lord's people. He wants to see all of us enslaved, like Lot had become. You know, Lot was in many ways not a very good Christian. But that makes him someone to whom each of us can relate. He was easy pickings for the devil who used this coalition of kings to, to capture him. We all, have our, we all have our sins, our weaknesses. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's depression or anxiety. Maybe it's an immoral relationship that you won't think you can't, won't get out of. Maybe it's, maybe it's pride and self-righteousness. The devil is the ultimate antagonist. He is always stirring the pot. He is always trying to wreak havoc. We have an enemy. And he will use anything and everything to enslave us. God's people have an enemy. Number two, God's people face overwhelming odds. Shador Leomer, I believe is the way you say his name. He was one of the kings, the main kings from this coalition in the north. He was a very powerful king. He had... Uh, many people under his thumb for a decade or really more than a decade, you would read in the first 13 verses there. He was a great warrior. He battled and won many uh, wars. He oppressed many people. The devil is like that as a powerful foe. Thankfully, you understand that the devil is not omnipresent. You do know that, don't you? He is an angel, but he is not God. The Lord himself is the only one who is omnipotent and omnipresent. The devil is not. I mean, he certainly has his minions and demons who are uh, roaming about. He's a strategic general sending out his demons to cause trouble and to enslave his people. The devil himself is singular and, and not omnipresent. So he's in one spot. On, you know, who knows who he's working on at this very moment? Very likely... Most of us here are, are smaller fries, small potatoes, and, and it's uh, his demons who are, who are, in a sense, uh, working to, to get us astray and lead us astray. They, they target Christians. Lot here, one who is captured and enslaved. Powerful forces, overwhelming at times forces. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And a great book to read to help you think about maybe how the devil might, uh, might work and think is C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters, which is an interesting book that is written from the perspective of a, a, a demon who's writing to who's one of his underlings. Remember 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 that reads, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. God's people have an enemy, and God's people face overwhelming odds. Number three, God's people engage in the battle. God's people engage in the battle. Verse 14 reads, When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Abraham, he led forth his trained men. He took the initiative. He stepped out in faith and love. I don't know about you, but my temptation would be to be so exasperated with Lot. <laughs> Here's this nephew of mine who seems to think only about himself, who seems to be an uh, expert at making bad decisions, doing the wrong thing again and again and again. I mean, I would be very much 
the, the thought would at least cross my mind. You know, Lot has dug his own grave. He's got to lie in it. You know, I'm, I sometimes can have the justice gene and, and make sure that everybody gets what they deserve. Yeah, Lot, you know, they just leave him to his own devices. But he's, he's dug his grave. He's got to lie in it. In this case, of course, Abraham steps out and rescues his nephew who didn't deserve it, who didn't deserve uh, this grace. What might it look like for us today to engage in the battle? We follow Abraham's lead, one who, as folks who've been called and restored and are involved then in the battle, what might it look like for us today, spiritually speaking? I'll give you a couple things, and then I'll throw out, just sort of mention several more, but you know, one thing that this might look like is hard conversations. Hard conversations, difficult conversations, conversations that are tense and really not enjoyable. You know, it's, it's sure it's nice to be able to go to a, a dinner party and just talk about football or the weather or whatever and keep everything at the surface. But the reality is the most fruitful conversations are often the hardest conversations where you have to bring up something significant. Something that's weighty, something that is hard. That's repair work, really. The Bible talks about the Word of God being for correcting and rebuking and training in righteousness and things like that. What might it look like for us as we engage in the battle? It is very likely going to look like some hard conversations. Correcting, rebuking, addressing difficult matters. A second thing that it might look like. It might look like personal discipleship, where you pour your life into another, where you have, where you're a mentor and you're, or you're mentoring someone who's maybe younger uh, physically and spiritually. Whereas the hard conversation is likely a, um, an act of, of, of repair work, this personal discipleship is more preventive maintenance. Helping someone develop and grow and mature in the Lord where you are mentoring them and you're discipling them and you're developing them and ministering to them. We need a lot more of that. We need a lot more of that sort of that, that relational mentoring and discipling going on in the church. Um, there's a, a book um, called The Trellis and the Vine. Hunter and I have been talking about it. And in this book, The Trellis and the Vine, it's, it's really talking about ministry in the church. And of course, the trellis... As you know, gardeners especially, the trellis is the wooden structure that the live vine grows upon. And you need the wooden structure there for it to, to make progress and become a fruitful vine. But the, it's the vine that is really the goal. That The vine is what you're watching and, and what is alive and, and is, is, is giving, it's, it gives life in a sense. The trellis is just needed there for the structure. And so in this book it's talking about how, yes, in the church we've, we've got structure, we've got trellises that we need to watch and make sure they're working properly and everything. But the goal is the vine. And that's the idea here in my mind of, of, of people who are growing spiritually. And so much spiritual growth takes place as people are involved in discipling, mentoring type relationships. And um, in, this, in this particular book it tells the story about how it kind of paints sort of a vignette of something that could happen. And probably did happen to the authors. I know it's happened uh, to me, and and I find myself uh, responding poorly often. But it's a situation where say say picture this: somebody in in church after one Sunday uh, service comes up to the preacher and says to him, "Hey, I I, I really want to get involved here. I want to serve in the church. You know, I want to I want to help out. What are some things that I can do?" As a pastor, our first thought is to say, well, we, you know, we've got a need on the missions committee, or we've got, we have some needs to um, help serve in this capacity or that capacity. Um, we, we've got um, vacation Bible school, and we've got this and that and the other. And so there are all these slots that we're wanting to see people fill. But he said, what if, rather than pastors or church leaders saying that, pointing to slots that people could fill, what if the pastor were to say, Again, remember they're in the sanctuary having this conversation where someone comes up and says, I want to get involved after the church. What if, what if the pastor says, says, instead said, you see that guy over there in the corner back there? Um, you know, he's just recently started coming to church. His wife's been coming here for years. He's just recently started coming. I don't think he knows anybody yet. Would you mind taking him out to lunch or something, getting to know him? 
Or, or what if he said, you, you see that couple over there that's, uh, that's on the side? Um, they've, been, they've been going through some, some marriage struggles, and they've even asked me if there might be a mentoring couple. Would you mind, you and your wife, having them over, or grilling out, and, and maybe spending some time with them around the table and getting to know them personally? And that, That's the kind of idea of personal discipleship, and this engaging in the battle to see people delivered from sin, which is what, again, Abraham did for Lot. I mean, it's lots of different things that it might look for you. For some, just engaging in the battle is going to be just greater diligence in prayer. For others, it's going to be um, personal evangelism. For others, it's going to be generous giving. For others, it's going to be involvement in missions. For others, it's going to be loving your neighbor. And really, in one sense, all of these should characterize all of us. But these are things that we do as we engage in the battle in order to see people delivered from the enemy. You know, you might say, man, I'm, I'm really not all that relational. I'm not very talkative. You can still use your gifts to see individual lives transformed. I appreciated what Jim was saying just a few minutes ago. He kind of joked about how these uh, folks that are here are scholars and, you know, brilliant. And I can't remember exactly how he said it, but I'm a very simple person or whatever he said. And, you know, and you know, he's here helping these folks come to know Christ. Praise the Lord. You know, maybe, maybe you are a task-oriented person. You know, you can say, hey, will you help me go build this deck or, or clean out the gutters for this widow who needs some help at her house or something like that. We all have our gifts, and we can use our gifts to see individual lives transformed. Final thought, number four, God's people overcome by the Lord. So we have an enemy. We face overwhelming odds. We engage in the battle. We overcome by the Lord. And that's where this Melchizedek character comes in, into play. It, verse 17 introduces Melchizedek. And, and really, were it not for Hebrews chapter 7, we wouldn't probably think all that much about this guy Melchizedek. But you can go back and maybe later look at Hebrews chapter 7 and learn a lot about this Melchizedek. He's an important figure because he's a type of Christ. He is a, a shadow of the Lord Jesus. He is, um, he, there's in a sense, he is footprints in the sand of what the coming Messiah would look like. Um, meaning there are a lot, a lot of similarities between this Melchizedek um, fe, uh, fella and, and the Lord Jesus. There are lots of types in the Old Testament. Noah is a type. If you were attached to Noah, then you were saved from God's wrath. Noah is a type of Christ. Same way, when we are attached to Christ, we are saved from the wrath of God. Abraham is a type in some ways. As you continue to read through um, Genesis, Joseph is one of the great types of Christ, shadow of the Lord Jesus. Remember, Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers, uh, unjustly imprisoned, and then eventually rises to power, and people are bowing before him. And that, doesn't that sound a little bit like the Lord Jesus? who was rejected by his brothers, unjustly imprisoned and crucified, risen from the dead, and every knee will bow before him. See, so that you've got these types in the Old Testament, and Melchizedek is one of them. One of the ways that we know that he's a type is because there's no genealogy listed here with Melchizedek. It's as if he just shows up on the scene, as if he always existed, and there's no record of his death. He's just this sort of cryptic figure that shows up in Genesis chapter 14. And he's essentially worshipped by Abraham. I mean, not really, but as Abraham pays him tithes, it's a way of recognizing that, the, that Melchizedek is special, that he represents the Lord, and that Abraham is the inferior one to this. And what, recognize, what Abraham recognized with the paying of these tithes is that the Lord gave the victory. The Lord provided this victory over these uh, kings, powerful kings from the north. And this is why we battle the Lord's ways, not according to the ways of the world, which is why we pray. You know, the way of the world would, would, would scoff at prayer and say, you need to get busy in order to engage in this battle. But we pray, we go to our knees. That's our first step in, in this engaging this battle to see others delivered from sin. So you've got all this with Abraham. But then amazingly, Abraham is blessed by Melchizedek. Melchizedek, the superior, blesses the inferior, Abraham. And that's what God does. 
That's what, that's what we see God do in this passage. That's what we see God do in life. He rescues people. He restores people. He delivers people. He blesses people. God keeps his promise to bless those who attach themselves to Abraham. And Lot was still attached to Abraham as his nephew. And he's blessed just like we, as we are attached to Christ, are blessed. I mean, Lot, again, he just keeps messing up again and again and again. And what does God do? He keeps on rescuing again and again and again. He never runs out of blessing. He never gets tired of rescuing his people. Lot is greatly blessed because of Abraham. Jesus is the greater Abraham. And the blessings are great to those who attach themselves to Christ Jesus. God commits himself to to those who are in Christ. We, we overcome our, our, our guilt through Jesus. We overcome the power of sin through Jesus. Never perfectly on this side of heaven, but we make progress. We are rescued through Christ. We are delivered through Christ. The story is told of a father in ancient times in the Middle East who had an irresponsible son. This is not the story of the prodigal son. This is a different uh, idea here. But this father had an irresponsible son who squandered his wealth. But this father had a very loyal and wise servant named Felix. And the father knew that he was going to die soon. And he wasn't going to give anything to his irresponsible son. So he called him in one day and said, I'm giving everything to Felix. He's the loyal one. He's the responsible one. He'll be, he's the one who's going to obey and, and do what I would want him to do. And so I'm giving everything to Felix. But I do love you. You are my son. So I'll give you one thing. You have your choice of one thing. What did the son say? I'll take Felix. Because <laughs> when he has Felix, he has everything. Have you taken Christ? Have you bowed the knee before the Lord Jesus? Have you given your life to him? Have you attached yourself to him? When you do, you then come out of the garage. You want to engage in the battle. As you know, the Lord will give you the victory. May we come out of the garage this week attached to Christ, seeing him work in us and through us. Let us pray. As we pray, some of you here today need to admit to the Lord that you've had a wrong view of who he is and of who you are. You need to confess to the Lord that you're a rebel, a sinner. You need to tell the Lord Jesus that you trust him to make you right with God. Perhaps you would want to pray something like this to the Lord silently in your heart. Father God, I confess that I am a rebel who has rejected you. Please forgive me of all my sin. I recognize that Jesus is Lord. I give my life to you, Jesus. Lord, in just a moment, we're going to sing Onward Christian Soldiers. And Lord, I pray that as we think about engaging in the battle to see uh, lives delivered from the power of sin, I pray that you would do a work in us, giving us great joy of all that we have in Christ because we are attached to him. Our sins are forgiven. We've been made right with God. We've been given power to live. Lord, may we go forth into the battle to see others released from sin and misery. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.